Thank you for downloading this edition of Wartime. Remember, as always, Wartime is fully supported by contributions from listeners like you. For more information, please visit wartimepodcast.com. I hope you enjoy the program. In the summer of 1763, the frontier was bathed in blood and burned to the ground as a massive Indian insurgency swept across the North American continent. Fueled by discontent as a result of British imperial austerity, native warriors turned to political upheaval and violent resistance in an attempt to terrorize settlers off of their ancestral hunting grounds. While the movement had many leaders and lacked true cohesion, the Ottawa chief Pontiac in the Great Lakes and the Mingo chief Gaius Suta in the Ohio country became the face of terror on the frontier. Their actions, along with a decided inaction on the part of the Empire, drove many American settlers to the brink and made open rebellion a real possibility for the first time. On this episode, we discuss Pontiac's Rebellion and the Indian Insurgency of 1763. I'm Brady Kreitzer, and this is Wartime. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another edition of Wartime. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. On Season 3 of the series, we're discussing the American Revolutionary Era, the people, places, and events that defined it, and the political ideologies that gave birth to the world's first truly modern republic. As always, remember, history is best when it's shared, and you can follow me on Twitter, at Brady Kreitzer, on my author's website, BradyKreitzer.com, and your home for everything wartime on the web, wartimepodcast.com. In Season 3 of the series, we're discussing the American Revolutionary Era, a period which we talk about a lot as a society, but on the whole we understand very little. We can make it very simple at times, but in this season I really want to explore just how complicated and just how complex the events that led to something as, in many ways, catastrophic as British Civil War really could be. In the last episode, we talked about the importance of a new year, a year that most Americans could not identify as special or unique at all, the year 1763. Now, in the Western context, we give almost all of our attention to the year 1776 regarding the American Revolution, and rightfully so. But as a historian, you have to understand that no one year is more significant or more impressive than any other, especially in an event that really takes over a decade to build up to, like the American Revolution. The year that I submit to you that we should begin, and the year in which Season 3 of Wartime does begin, is the year 1763. Now in 1763, as a quick refresher, the British Empire is going through a major year of change. For much of the last decade, they've been fighting a world war, in fact, the largest war in world history, against their age-old nemesis, the French. They fought this war on five separate continents. It was a war that literally cost them a fortune of blood and treasure. But in 1763, the combat comes to an end, and the Great War for Empire, the Seven Years' War, is over. If you are British at this time, your world is changing in major and impressive ways. With the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763, the British Empire virtually doubled overnight. All land that was formerly French colonial holding now transferred to British colonial holding, at least to a degree in the name of the treaty they signed. The great victory for the British, the great Uh, capture for them in many ways, was the victory of North America and the conquest of New France. What the British gain on that continent is the equivalent of all of Canada and the Mississippi River Valley uh, from the French. It's an enormous conquest. It's an enormous takeover. Now, the British have a major problem in 1763, and their problem is they have all of this new territory, 
but no real effective way of governing it. In previous seasons of wartime, we've talked about how the British have a very one-size-fits-all policy of empire, whether the colonies in Jamaica, whether the colonies in Africa, whether the colonies in Asia, or whether the colonies in North America, the same general rules apply. If you continue through Season 1 of Wartime, you'll see that, just in the North American colonies alone, all 13 of them are all very different. Well, because of this issue, and because of the relative inflexibility of the British Empire at the time, you begin to see that their old one-size-fits-all policy does not necessarily apply to these new colonies. And the fact that they had just fought the largest, most expensive war in their history puts even more strain on them. Of course, that strain is financial strain. In the previous episode of Wartime, Season 3, Episode 1, we talked about how the British dealt with the enormous imperial debt that followed the Seven Years' War. Before the Seven Years' War, the imperial debt was roughly 74 million pounds, and after the war, it ballooned up to all the way to 124 million pounds. They had to do something about their debt. Now, the way they tackled it, in my opinion, was a very sensible way. They knew they had to uh, cut spending and probably raise taxes. And unlike in our own world, they were willing to do both to balance the budget. A lot of people in our country talk about the need to balance the budget in 2014. Uh, and the really effective way you do that is by doing both increasing revenue, raising taxes, and austerity measures, cutting spending. If you really care about the budget, you'll do both. Look at the political debates we're having in this country today, and you'll see that one side wants to raise revenue, one side wants to cut spending, but nobody wants to do both. If you do that, everybody's guilty and you make a lot of political enemies. Politics are everything in the 21st century, and they're everything in the 18th. Well, the British do take on the policy of officially doing both, raising taxes and cutting spending. And the decision to do so uh, sows the seeds very early on, in 1763, of the American Revolution. In their minds, the American colonists uh, have the most to gain from the victory against the French in the Seven Years' War. And most of the fighting, and therefore most of the money, was spent in North America. In their minds, it only seems fair... Since most of the money was spent there, and since the Americans will profit the most from the war, it's only fair that they should shoulder the burdens of helping to pay for this war. Whose taxes will go up? The Americans' taxes will go up. Whose spending will be cut? The Americans' spending will be cut. It's that simple. The seeds of the American Revolution are sown with a political decision made in London in 1763 to balance the imperial budget. Now, in the previous episode, we talked about what those spending cuts really were. In the American Revolution, we always talk about taxes, taxes, taxes. And that is fair, and they are present. We'll talk about them in a future episode. But what I really want to hit on for the first few episodes of wartime are the effects of these spending cuts. The man most responsible uh, for implementing the dirty work, the spending cuts of North America, is General Jeffrey Amherst the commander-in-chief of the 8,000 military forces in North America at the time. He looks at where the British are spending the most unnecessarily, and he makes the calculated decision uh, that the frontier region is the region that's sort of gobbling up most of the resources and that can afford to cut the most, but where. That takes us to our main topic of discussion today. There was a delicate balance in 1763 between European empires, the British and French, immediately before the fall of New France, and the native world on the frontier. Now, in the first episode of the season, we used the word Indian world, and that's a fine word, you can do that, but you have to understand it's actually much more complicated than that, and that's what we're going to really dig into in this episode. The Indian world largely is dominated in the Northeast by a major superpower uh, known as the Iroquois Confederacy. They're an enormous confederacy of people consisting of six tribes that really live in the state of New York. But they govern the immediate area surrounding them, the satellite regions, very much like an empire. Now, the Iroquois Confederacy, since the early 18th century, are strong British allies. 
strong British allies. And after the fall of New France, they stand, in their opinion, to benefit from British policy. They are largely immune from the topic we're going to talk about today. But what about all the other native peoples of North America, especially between uh, the end of Iroquois to the Great Lakes? Well, they're really left out of the equation in a real way. Because during the Seven Years' War, they, unlike the Iroquois Confederacy, were not British allies. They were French allies. And with the French gone, they were left holding their rifles by themselves. Now, there's a real debate uh, in these sort of satellite native communities after the Seven Years' War over what their future will look like. Many people think their Indian economy that's been wholly supported by European trade for the last 50 years will continue. As we talked about in the previous episode of Wartime, the British and French poured goods into Indian lands to gain them as allies. If the French were giving goods, the British had to keep up, and vice versa. Well, with the French gone, Geoffrey Amherst makes the decision the British Empire is spending too much money, and the place they're spending too much money is giving goods to the Indians. If the only reason they were giving goods to those Indians is because the French were anyway, why should they continue now that the French are gone? Here we see the root of the problem of today's episode. Now, these old French allies, again, not the Iroquois Confederacy, not the group in upstate New York, but the old French allies, are largely broken down into three distinct regions. The first, and easternmost, uh, is what is today western Pennsylvania and the state of Ohio, parts of West Virginia and Indiana, we call the Ohio Country. The second, uh, in the Great Lakes, a region that the French call the Pays d'Anneau, uh, are strong French allies uh, who had seen the benefit of New France for over a hundred years. That's the Great Lakes region. And the third group, the, the farthest away from this narrative, but the closest still involved, live in a place we call the Illinois country. These are all major French allies, and when the French lose, when they leave, they're really left on their own. There's a great deal of uncertainty at the time. Now, as anticipated by some in the native world, particularly Gaia Suta, of the Ohio country, an experienced diplomat, and the topic, mind you, of my third book, the Indian economy does begin to collapse. And the reason it collapses is because British goods stop coming. Gaia Suta warned in 1761, just because the French have lost, doesn't mean we should stop fighting. The British will not continue to give us goods. Our economy will fall apart, our world will be devastated. No one wanted to listen in 1761. Sure enough, by 1763, these old frontier native allies of the French are realizing that prediction is absolutely coming true. As we left off in the previous episode, as tough economic times hit, religious fervor increases. That happens everywhere around the world during bad economic times. And a religious Delaware leader named Neolin begins to preach that the only way for the Indian world to survive is to eliminate white ways. Go back to your Indian ways. Hunt with a bow and arrow, not with a musket. Wear deerskin clothing. Don't wear European-style clothing. Don't drink European alcohol. Expel that from your body. All of these things, Neolin says, is eliminating our Indian way of life. Just because the Europeans aren't giving us what we need anymore doesn't mean we have to suffer as a result. We just have to change the way we view the world. Now, Neolin gets a big following. Again, he's delivering a positive message that many, many desperate people need to hear on the frontier. He does very well in the Ohio country. He does very well in the subsequent areas as well. But Neolin never preaches the elimination of white settlement. He's not a violent man. He's a religious man. But he has a positive religious message. And it doesn't take long for that positive religious message to be hijacked and applied to political violent means. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The man considered most responsible uh, for taking the message of Neolin, the elimination of white waves, 
and making it politically violent, making it the elimination of white people altogether, is an Ottawa chief named Pontiac. Now, Pontiac lives in the Pays d'Anno. Pontiac lives in the Great Lakes. And he has the vision that Neolin is correct. Elimination of white ways is essential. But he doesn't believe you can do that without eliminating white people. And what he comes up with is a large-scale rebellious plan, Pontiac, the Ottawa chief, to eliminate all white settlement on the frontier, violently and painfully, if necessary. Now remember, the white settlers he's talking about are British citizens. They're the ones in their minds that just won the Seven Years' War. They are proud to be British. They are excited about the prospects of a British world without French incursion. But the problem is now, they're in the crosshairs of a massive Indian uprising. Now here's what's very important for me. We call this event Pontiac's Rebellion. But the issue is, Pontiac really only leads this rebellion in the Great Lakes region, amongst the Ottawa, the Ojibwa, the Potawatomi, the Great Lakes peoples. He never moves into the Ohio country, that easternmost French allied region. That's a region of the Shawnee, the Delaware, and the Mingo. Pontiac has no standing there, and he doesn't lead there. The man who leads the rebellion in that region was the man who correctly predicted the uh, economic collapse would occur in the first place, Gaia of the Mingo, then later of the Seneca. So when we talk about Pontiac's rebellion, and we largely do that because of a historian named Francis Parkman in the 19th century, he published a book he called The Conspiracy of Pontiac, you're really doing a disservice to the real complexity of the event. It has many leaders for similar reasons, but with different regional standing. The term I like to use, rather than Pontiac's Rebellion, is the Indian Insurgency of 1763. In fact, if you even wanted to take it further, you could describe it as maybe the Pontiac Insurgency in the Great Lakes and the Ohio Insurgency in the Ohio country. Because even though they're motivated by the same factors and the same decisions, they do have some, some very important differences, uh, which really doesn't allow us to call it all Pontiac's Rebellion. It takes a lot of the credit and undermines, I think, a lot of the major players in each of the three regions we've talked about. So what is the event? What occurs? Well, Pontiac's basic vision uh, for expelling white people, European settlement, and what he considers to be encroachment from the frontier is by eliminating the British presence in the region. Now, you have to remember what the British colonies looked like at the time. The vast majority of the population is centered around the Atlantic seaboard. Just about everybody is east of the Appalachian Mountains. But for the people west of it, and there aren't that many of them compared to east of the mountains, they have a very fragile uh, hold on the land. And most of that hold comes from the military. The British Empire has built a series of strategically placed forts all across the frontier. And these forts will serve as their sort of administrative hub of the region and also be the real concrete pillar of the uh, non-military, of the civilian communities of the area. Where the Allegheny, Monongahela, and Ohio rivers come together in the Ohio country, the real heart of the Ohio country, they'll build Fort Pitt. And the city that surrounds it will become known as Pittsburgh. The other giant fort they have west of the Appalachian Mountains is in the Great Lakes. It was originally built by the French, but the British have commandeered it, called Fort Detroit. Now, they have many small satellite forts all around Fort Pitt and Fort Detroit, even connecting them east to west through the Great Lakes region, through Ohio, and so on. And the British believe this system gives them a very tenable but very practicable hold over the region. Now this is the brilliance of Pontiac in the Great Lakes and Gaia Suta in the Ohio country. They view the map and they understand this system. They understand that without these British forts, white settlers have literally no protection uh, and no reason to stay in their lands. So Pontiac and Gaia Suta separately come up with the same general scheme. 
attack these major forts, Pontiac attacking Fort Detroit uh, in the Great Lakes, Gayasuta attacking Fort Pitt in the Ohio country, and like dominoes, all the other forts will fall, and then all of the white settlers will leave the region. Now, it's a very uh, simple mechanism that we see all the time. It's political violence. That's their main means of success. The idea is, taking these forts might be very difficult. There'd be a long, hard struggle. But it doesn't necessarily predicate uh, some white settlers leaving just by taking them. So Pontiac and Gaia Suta will turn to, again, a mechanism we're very familiar with in the 21st century. We call terrorism. When I talk about the Pontiac Rebellion of 1763, or the Indian Insurgency of 1763, I always use the word terrorism. And that's gotten me into hot water from time to time, because it's a very loaded term. But the very basic definition of terrorism is political violence. That's all it is. Uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. We understand that old mantra. Uh, but political violence is the key. The native peoples of the frontier, uh, of their many tribes, have a very firm belief that if you can scare a community into feeling unsafe, they'll leave. You don't have to kill all of them. You just have to kill some of them very publicly. So during this Indian uprising, some of the things you would see are pretty horrific stuff. Um, again, you know, North America and the colonial age is really a land of roads and rivers for the most part. There's no railways. Uh, and major roads connect to small subsidiary roads. So it's not uncommon in 1763, once this message of white removal takes hold, uh, for Indian bands to fall on a single man or a single family traveling these roads. Uh, they'd kill them. They'd mutilate them, and they'd leave them in a very public place. They'd hang them from trees and disembowel them. They'd cut their heads off. They'd leave hom tomahawks in their chest. Very brutal, horrible stuff. And they do it so that other people see it. Other white settlers traveling that same road will see this very gruesome and horrible scene, and they will believe that they're not safe. And they'll willingly, voluntarily, for obvious reasons, flee the area. That's the plan. That's terrorism. Um, and it works very well in colonial America in 1763. Look at terrorism in the world today. You have people being killed, you have people being murdered, but it's always in the public eye. It does not serve a terrorist any good uh, to commit an atrocity or commit a crime and do it behind closed doors. They need people to see it because it spreads the political message of fear. And that's the driving force here. Pontiac's Rebellion, or the Insurgency of 1763, is political violence to the extreme. But it works very well uh, for the peoples involved. So what's the general story? Pontiac will lead the charge in the Great Lakes. Again, he wants to eliminate all white settlement from the region, but he doesn't necessarily have to do it uh, in a in a way that threatens or even physically attacks everyone. He has to have a major strike, and again, the political violence will trickle down. Pontiac's plan is the capture of Fort Detroit. Now, Pontiac's general idea before this are that the British and his peoples, the Ottawa, the Potawatomi, uh, the Ojibwa, have a good relationship, they think. The British use Fort Detroit as a major trading hub, they use Fort Detroit as a major hub of diplomacy. They know who Pontiac is. Well, Pontiac's scheme he comes up with uh, is essentially to use that friendship, to use that relationship, to sabotage the British. He and several of his men plan on walking into Fort Detroit as friends, but then suddenly removing their garments, revealing their heavily armed weaponry uh, and, their, and their very... Uh, hostile intentions, and capturing the fort that way. That's the plan. Unfortunately for Pontiac, the commandant of the fort receives word that that's going to happen. Uh, Pontiac and his men will attempt to enter the fort. The British begin opening fire on them. The exchange begins. The entire attack falls apart. Pontiac, in his planning, believed he could infiltrate Fort Detroit and capture it from the inside and do it relatively easily. And the fact of the matter is, if the Commandant 
of Fort Detroit didn't know that was going to happen, Pontiac probably could have been very successful. But instead, what occurs uh, is Pontiac has to fall back. And rather than just capturing Fort Detroit, he still has it in a very uh, untenable situation. He places it under siege. Uh, and, and this begins in the spring of 1763. Pontiac's warriors surround the fort. They cut it off from supplies. And they institute a siege of Fort Detroit. Now, the idea of a siege, I think, is a very interesting one. It's one of the oldest tactics in the history of militaria, and it almost always works if done under certain conditions. The first condition is that you have to have more supplies than your enemy you're surrounding. Pontiac uh, may or may not have that. Remember, most of his supplies come from the British themselves. But the other factor you have to have on your side is time, and Pontiac doesn't really have that either. But the idea is that you surround a fort, you let nothing get in, you let nothing get out, and you starve the people out. Remember, walls are really good at keeping people away, but walls can also be used to keep you in. And that's Pontiac's basic idea. Across the frontier in the Ohio country, a very similar set of circumstances occurs in and around the Three Rivers, in and around Fort Pitt. It's an amazing thing after the siege of Fort Detroit begins. And if you can envision a map of the American Northeast with the Great Lakes in the West and the Atlantic Ocean in the East, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Fort Detroit, we'll say for our purposes, is the westernmost point on this map. All across, moving eastward, are other tiny forts, leading to Fort Pitt in the east. Uh, it's like a, a very expensive, very deadly game of connect the dots. Well, if you're standing at Fort Pitt, mind you, the topic of my second book, we spend three chapters on this event because I think it's so important. You can see this Indian uprising, this Indian insurgency beginning to spread. Again, the siege of Fort Detroit begins in May. If you look at that map one by one, like a coming storm, like a hurricane, one tiny fort after another tiny fort, these satellite forts that connect Fort Detroit and Fort Pitt begin to fall. In May, Fort Sandusky, a minor fort along Lake Erie, will be captured and destroyed. Fort St. Joseph, outside of Fort Detroit, will be captured and destroyed. Fort Miami, in the present-day site of Fort Wayne, Indiana, will be captured and destroyed. Fort Michilimackinac in Michigan will be captured and destroyed by the Indians. Again, this all plays into their plan. Eliminate the British from the frontier by eliminating what keeps them there, their forts. The capture of Fort Michilimackinac is an interesting one. It happens in June, June 2nd of 1763. Effectively, what happens is this. The local Ojibwa tribe who's, who's attacking the fort had been around the region for some time, and the men within the garrison of Fort Michilimackinac know them very well. The Indians will talk to the garrison. They'll ask them to play a game of stickball, effectively. Um, and it's something that the two groups have done all the time. If you go to military bases today, there's a lot of downtime. People play wiffle ball and, and things like that. Uh, well, as the garrison came out to engage in this game of stickball, completely unaware of the events occurring for Detroit, uh, the Ojibwa will turn and massacre the entire garrison and destroy the fort. Very quickly, all these events happening in the Pays d'Anneau, the Great Lakes region, begin to spill over, until they spill over completely into the Ohio country. There are four major forts in the Ohio country, Fort Pitt being the biggest, where the three rivers come together. But then moving north all the way to Lake Erie, if you can have a map and visualize this, you have three other British, formerly French, but now British forts. North of uh, Fort Pitt, is Fort Venango. North of that is Fort Le Bouffe, built by the French, and north of that is Fort Presque Isle. All of them were French strongholds during the Seven Years' War that were ultimately captured and controlled by the British in the aftermath. Well, Gaia Suta, rather than Pontiac, will implement Pontiac's strategy in the region, and one by one, the satellite forts will fall. Fort Presque Isle will fall, Fort Le Bouffe will fall, Fort Venango will fall. Not in that order, mind you, but that's just moving north to south. Until the only fort left in the entire region 
uh, is Fort Pitt itself. And of course, Fort Pitt will be surrounded, just as Fort Detroit was, and placed under siege. Now, this is the status quo of the Indian Rebellion in the summer of 1763. The frontier literally went from being a place of peace and diplomacy to a place of complete and total violence in the matter of a few weeks, and the British administrators were not prepared to confront it. Not only are these forts under attack, but British settlers all over the region are fleeing in a massive refugee crisis because they fear for their lives. The atrocities that occur here uh, rank in the hundreds. Hundreds of families are found and massacred by raiding native parties during the Indian insurgency of 1763. And they're not just killed outright, but they're killed in very violent, terrible ways. Again, the idea is terrorism. The idea is to spread fear. In my opinion, this is one of the single bloodiest moments of all of colonial America. The Pontiac Rebellion, or, I think more appropriately, the Indian Insurgency of 1763. Terrible stuff. Thousands flee the frontier. Hundreds die. The frontier is a terrible, bloody place. And that's exactly what the native leaders want. Again, they want to frighten individuals off of land they believe to be theirs. Now, in many ways, with Fort Detroit currently under siege and Fort Pitt currently under siege, the situation seems very dire for the British Empire. There are two major acquisitions on the frontier after the Seven Years' War, taken by the French, their old modern nemesis, uh, is now at risk of falling to a group of people they don't even consider to be human most of the time. They consider the native peoples to be subhuman. They certainly treat them that way. While those subhumans are about to teach you a very dangerous lesson. There will be relief coming to these fortifications. Uh, Fort Detroit, the siege there, will begin to die out. Over time, Pontiac will disappear into the Illinois country. He'll go into hiding. But I think the siege of Fort Pitt, even though Fort Detroit was the, the first siege, and how they break it, was actually much more interesting. Out of Philadelphia, uh, Jeffrey Amherst will send a relief expedition under the command of a Swiss mercenary named Henry Bouquet. Henry Bouquet is in the British Army, but he's a soldier of fortune. He's not British. He speaks French. He does speak English as well. Uh, and he is a hard man. He fought valiantly in the Seven Years' War on behalf of the British Empire. Jeffrey Amherst has no problem sending Henry Bouquet with about 500 men to relieve Fort Pitt. Now, the 500 men he takes are an interesting mix of people. Uh, there are some native provincials. Those are Americans themselves. But the majority of the column is made up of British regulars, but not just any British regulars. They are made up of the 42nd Highland Regiment, the Black Watch, as they're known as. These are Scotsmen. Uh, they wear the red coat of the British Army, but they wear tartan kilts uh, as well. Uh, they are considered by many to be not a specialized force, but they're certainly a notable force because they're Highlanders. They are rough tribal people, just like the native peoples attacking Fort Pitt. Well, Henry Bouquet will spend almost all of July marching across what is today southern Pennsylvania with this relief column. And his plan is to bring provisions and weapons and supplies to Fort Pitt. Well, as he's making his way there, Indian scouts that have surrounded Fort Pitt for several weeks now are well aware that he's coming. The reason they are is they've intercepted intelligence from Henry Bouquet to the Commandant of Fort Pitt saying, hey, help is on the way. Well, when they realize he's getting close, and people within Fort Pitt actually write this, they don't know what's going on. Many of the Indian warriors surrounding Fort Pitt will abandon their position and march headlong into the wilderness to meet this oncoming British relief column. The place they'll meet is about 25 miles away from Fort Pitt, uh, in the middle of the wilderness, uh, called Bushy Run Station. Now, Bushy Run Station is not much. It's a small outpost on a creek in the wilderness. But for the British, who move back and forth between those two points all the time, it's sort of the halfway point where you know you can rest and relax. For that reason, the Indians will be waiting. The uh, Shawnee, the Delaware, the Mingo, all led by Gaia Suta. But when Henry Bouquet uh, gets to that place, 
in August of 1763. Uh, the ambush is set, and a major battle occurs in the wilderness. We call it the Battle of Bushy Run. It lasts two days, and in the end, the Highlanders, the British, are victorious. Now, that seems very easy for most people to understand. They're a modern army, they're heavily armed, they're facing a uh, sort of disparate Indian uprising. But Bushy Run is the first and only uh, British defeat of an Indian force in the history of North America. In a place where a British uh, army is fighting an Indian force exclusively, no French allies, just British versus Indian, Bushy Run is the first and only time that happens in American history. It's the single greatest Indian defeat by British force uh, in the history of the continent. Because of that, Henry Bouquet becomes a legendary figure in the British world, so to speak. And people hear about this victory all the way in London. In Philadelphia, they ring church bells in celebration of it. Uh, Henry Bouquet will defeat the Ohio and warriors that have been besieging Fort Pitt, continue to the, to the fort, and resupply it. Uh, it's a major event that is often overlooked, I think, in, in British North American history. But it's a major event. It's a major event because the forces defeated at Bushy Run, the native forces who fought for two, two days and fought very valiantly, were the people besieging Fort Pitt. Not only that, but they were the majority of warriors instigating the Indian uh, insurrection, the Indian insurgency that year. With the defeat at Bushy Run, they're devastated. They can't continue uh, the attack. They certainly can't continue the war. And although they'll be fighting for several more months here and there, for the most part, Bushy Run crushes the Indian insurrection uh, in the Ohio country in 1763. It's a major watershed moment, I think, in Ohio and Indian history. Uh, I treat it that way in my biography of Gaia Suits. I really believe it ends whatever old vestige of French alliance and old hatred of the British Empire remains. And it really opens the frontier for peace, they hope, in the future. Now, what does this have to do with the American Revolution? Well, everything. I mentioned in the previous podcast uh, that many, many, many people believe the sole cause of the American Revolution was taxes. Taxes. And taxes are important. Uh, but people on the frontier really don't pay taxes very often. In fact, they move there because they have inherent distrust of government and imperial policy. So if someone from, say, Boston or Philadelphia or New York came to the people of the frontier, the white settlers of the frontier, and said, join us in this American Revolution, they're making us pay taxes, most people on the frontier would probably say, what do I care? So what? I don't pay my taxes. Your city life has nothing to do with my very rough own country life. Uh, but there is an animosity on the frontier that has nothing to do with taxes and has everything to do with that Indian uprising I just described that began as a result of 1763 and the end of the Seven Years' War. People on the frontier began to ask questions like, am I not a British citizen? Don't I deserve to be protected like any British citizen should? Indian violence is decimating our communities. It's decimating our families. This would never happen in London. This would never happen in Philadelphia. Why are you letting it happen to us? Now, there's a lot of blame to go around. But most of those frontiersmen blamed the empire for not protecting them. It's a pretty amazing idea. They had anger. They had animosity. It had nothing to do with raising of taxes, which we'll talk about but it had to do with a lack of protection uh, from Indian attack. So I think you have to understand the American Revolution really is a two-sided coin. One side of it, yes, is taxes go up. People in cities care about that as a political issue. But the other side, and I think the other much more pressing side on the frontier, is the spending cuts. Revenue increases and austerity. The spending cuts went to defending the frontier and... Uh, a cessation of gift-giving to the Indians, of trade with the Indians. And the result was a lot of very angry British settlers who feel like their government had abandoned them. That's the reason they take up arms against Great Britain at its core, uh, not because of taxes in the East. So if you're the British Empire, if you're King George, if you're his uh, cabinet, how do you deal with this? What can you do 
How do you make these people on the frontier feel safe, but at the same time, deal with your overarching problem of the crushing, crushing debt? If you want to send troops to the frontier, it's going to cost you money. But remember, you're still trying to recover from the Seven Years' War. The last thing you want to do is spend more money. So what will you come up with? The, the decision that King George makes and his cabinet uh, will radically direct the North American colonies toward separation and revolution more than anything he's done yet in 1763. He issues what we call the Proclamation of 1763. That's an important one. You have to know it. Because here's what King George basically says. And when I say King George, of course, I'm, I'm talking about British administration as a whole, symbolically. The Proclamation of 1763 does a few different things. Um, at a practical level, it organizes the new colonies taken from France in the Seven Years' War into official British colonies. It calls Canada Quebec. It divides Florida uh, into East and West Florida. And it establishes a colonial government in Grenada and makes them officially part of the British world. But what about the Indian violence? Well, this is where things get to be very controversial. The king basically says, in so many words, we're going to draw a line across the continent. Remember, most British cities were east of the Appalachian Mountains anyway, and most of this violence is occurring on the frontier, west of the Appalachian Mountains. King George draws an invisible line along that mountain chain. And he calls this the Proclamation Line of 1763. And he basically says, this is a new dividing line uh, between the British world and the Indian world. He says, yes, you are British citizens. Yes, you deserve protection. Yes, you shouldn't just be massacred. And that's a word they use, massacred. Uh, massacre is an interesting term. It's all just warfare. It's all just violence. But massacre is exclusively reserved for when white people are attacked by Indians. Never the other way around, of course. Uh, but massacre is almost completely tied to Indian violence. Keep that in mind for later episodes. And he says this, if you are a white settler and you live beyond the proclamation line of 1763 in Indian land, uh, you are breaking the law. You are guilty and you'll be punished for this. That's his decision. You have a whole bunch of angry frontiersmen, British soldiers, many of them who fought in the Seven Years' War, waiting for protection, waiting to have uh, their British rights protected. Uh, and what they get is a proclamation basically saying, if you choose to live there, it's your own fault. Uh, the king sort of reveals how neutered he is in a lot of ways by his inability to confront this violence with force. Uh, but it angers a lot of frontiersmen along the way. That's his great response to the single largest insurgency until the American Revolution, of course, in all of British North America. Not very effective. Not very effective. Now, that's how it will be perceived on the frontier. That's the political spin. Uh, the king can't protect us, so he's blaming us for living there rather than sending troops to protect us. But if you read the verbiage, if you read the language of the Proclamation of 1763, it says very clearly, this is to protect the allied Indians, not to protect the soldiers. Keep the two populations separate. It'll keep violence down on both sides. Uh, of course, it won't be perceived as that, and it'll add to some serious tension on the frontier in the future. So as we've mentioned, the American Revolution is diverse. Colonial America is a very diverse place, filled with different peoples, with different interests and different issues all around. To think that they're all driven by the same motivations, and the same factors, is thoroughly and utterly ridiculous. Uh, and you'll see that, again, taxes in the East, tea taxes and stamp ta ta taxes and all of these things, uh, mean very little to a frontiersman scraping out a life in the mountains. What he wants is to protect his family uh, from Indian attack and Indian assault. What the Indians want is the same. Uh, they want no encroachment on their land to protect their own families and their own ways of life. Colonial America is a very difficult place. It's a very brutal and violent place. Uh, and the American Revolution will turn the world upside down. And you have to understand that doesn't happen easily, and it doesn't happen quickly. We're already on episode two, and we're still in 1763. We're not even in the right decade yet, as far as most people are concerned. But I want you to have this understanding. I want you to know the full depth and breadth of this event.
because I think, even though it breaks the common narrative, it makes the American Revolution all that more impressive. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brady Kreitzer, and this is Wartime.